All right, everybody, let's get this show started. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be with you here in the year 2023, which I'll say doesn't even sound like a real year, at least not yet. It hasn't sunk in yet. Get it? We're talking about shipwrecks today. Anyway, Happy New Year, everybody. This is the first lecture for the Lunchtime Discovery Series in the new year, uh, and I'm so excited to be here with you all. We've got a great topic. I'm glad that you're all here, ready to lunch and learn with us. Uh, the Lunchtime Discovery Series is broadcast by us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, but it's organized and hosted as well by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, together working to bring you a great program most Wednesdays at noon. Uh, you can check out the Office of Environmental Education's website, eenorthcarolina.org, or the museum's website, naturalsciences.org. And there you can find the schedule for upcoming Lunchtime Discovery Series lectures. Uh, we've got some really cool and exciting stuff coming up in the next several weeks. So I hope that you will go ahead and mark your calendars, bookmark the museum's YouTube channel, click the little bell to get notified when we go live, uh, because this is going to be a great program to stay tuned into. Lots of interesting people to meet and interesting stuff to learn about. Uh, my name is Chris. I work here at the museum as the coordinator for current science programming. But you're not here to meet me. You're here to meet interesting people like today's guest speaker, uh, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. But I do want to remind everybody, before I forget, that the Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. As we go through the program, make sure that you are dropping your questions, thoughts, comments, and experiences into the chat as we go along, because I'm going to need your questions to pose to today's guest speaker after the presentation. And now I will introduce today's guest speaker. Everybody, I want you to meet Dr. Aaron Field. Dr. Field is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at East Carolina University and joins me now. Hi, Dr. Field. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about shipwrecks and microbes. Yeah, this is um, an interesting topic to me. Like, I think everybody likes the the mystery and mystique of a shipwreck, but you've got an interesting angle on them. Yeah, absolutely. I've been really fortunate. It's a tough job to get to study shipwrecks uh, for a living. But really, I mean, by the end of today, I think all of you are going to think of shipwrecks and also think of microbes. Uh, right now, you probably don't think of both together. So I can't wait to jump into it. I'm excited for it. This is going to be great. Uh, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you all for joining on uh, what I understand is the first one of 2023. So. Happy New Year. <laughs> Perfect. And hopefully you guys can see my slides okay. Looks good. Uh, perfect. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. And you know, today's the day we're going to start talking about shipwreck microbiomes. Um, it's a fascinating topic that I really love, and hopefully by the end of today, you will as well. Um, and so first, we're just going to start by thinking about ships themselves, right? So the life of a ship. I'm showing you four different photos of different ships. And when you stop and think about them, typically we think about each one has its own uh, kind of life story. It was made with different materials, probably for different purposes. It went different places and uh, the lifespan of it uh, will vary. So we have so many different kinds of ships that are out there. And in some cases, when the uh, ship comes to the end of its life, it could be because it was um, compromised and potentially even sinks. So at this point, you know, we think about it in terms of well, a ship sinks and the first thought is loss of property, loss of the vessel itself. Um, that's never something we want to see. We think about the history of that ship. What did it do? Where did it go? Uh, what won't it get to do now that it is sunk? Um, and in very unfortunate situations, sometimes even loss of life. So, you know, this is really where we think of shipwrecks and then um, we often talk about them in those contexts. 
But one thing we don't think about too often is the fact that these vessels, when they reach the ocean floor or the floor bed of a river or a freshwater lake, they really become new habitats and they start a whole nother life that we often don't even think about. So for example, when it reaches the bottom, often you'll um, it'll settle into some sort of sediment. Um, that sediment can actually enter the water column due to the physical mixing. There are microbes in all of these areas. So there are microbes living in that sediment. There are microbes living in the water. And there's some microbes that actually went down with the uh, vessel itself. And so all of these microbes take this vessel as a new habitat. So often habitats are limiting in these systems and there's so many microbes out there, they're always looking for a new place to live. So when a, uh, a ship sinks and actually becomes this new habitat, they will attach and set up their own community. Uh, often they also can be energy sources for these microbes. So for example, uh, steel hulled wrecks, things made of metals, they contain iron and iron is a requirement uh, for life for many organisms. Uh, so with microbes, they need iron to live. And so this is a new source of iron because otherwise it's often limiting in their environments and the oceans in particular, and they have to fight over it. So now they have a new source of energy in addition to a new home to live. So they really are what we call the primary colonizers of these wrecks. So they're the first to attach and set up a home and they make a nice area and community for other organisms, large organisms to come in. So that's what you can see in the upper right picture here. You have sponges, you have, um, often we can get oysters, we have seaweed and seagrasses, and then we have uh, fish that come in because this is a nice protective home for them. So in this case, what you're seeing is the development of an artificial reef. So in this case, the wreck is actually a good thing. It's promoting biological diversity. It's um, becoming a nice home for all sorts of different organisms. And at the end of the day, this is a good thing. We want to preserve these wrecks in order to maintain that. So microbes in those cases are really helping. They're promoting this kind of environment. On the flip side, microbes can also cause uh, deterioration of these wrecks. And they do that through causing corrosion, which we'll talk more about in a minute. And so really my lab and our goals have really been well, what role do microbes play in these overall processes? So if a wreck becomes an artificial reef long-term or if it's deteriorated, like you see in that lower right picture, how do we know which one they're going to be? How does this occur and what role do microbes really play? Um, and this is really important for a number of reasons. So one of the things that uh, has made people really start thinking more about the role of microbes and, and shipwrecks in general is the idea of when we look at the Titanic. So what you're seeing here are photos of the Titanic. Um, we know it's a very historical wreck. I know that the uh, museum right now has some great exhibits on shun uh, sunken shipwrecks, um, the Titanic being one of the most historically relevant uh, that we all know and have heard about over the years. And the reality is, is this wreck is made of metal. And at the end of the day, these are starting to deteriorate. So the Titanic will deteriorate in our lifetime. And that's a huge statement. So this came out in a few articles in recent years. And what they're realizing is it's deteriorating more rapidly than we ever thought. Now, I'm not saying that the entire Titanic is going to just up and disappear, but some of the most notable parts of it that you know we identify, like the bow here, they are corroding and disappearing. So how is this happening? That is one of the big questions, right? Like, why is this happening? Uh, and there's a number of things that contribute. So some of it is currents, so physically removing things, uh, corrosion due to chemical corrosion through salt. Uh, when I say corrosion, basically what that means is that the metal is oxidizing and becoming insoluble. So you get this rust, and that's what you see in these photos is that rusticles. So uh, all of these can be problematic. Um, and then the other thing that's occurring is the actual, what we call iron eating bacteria or organisms that eat that rust. So a microbe Halomonas titanicae has been identified as, as really contributing quite a bit to this. So it's eating the rust to get that iron I was telling you about, and then it's disappearing. So little by little, we're actually seeing the deterioration and it's happening so much faster than we thought. And we know microbes are a big part of that. Unfortunately, we still don't know how or why so many of the basic questions. So we're really trying to answer some of those in the hopes that, you know, we can preserve these historical artifacts, these artificial reefs, um, and, and kind of make it better for the environment as a whole. Okay, so I keep mentioning this phrase corrosion, biocorrosion. Essentially what this means is that the microbes that live on these wrecks on the surface can contribute to the deterioration. 
And what they're doing, again, is they're oxidizing the metals that are in those wrecks and that's causing rust to produce. Uh, when this rust forms, it's basically then can be washed away, it can be eaten by other microbes, and ultimately, little by little, these wrecks start to disappear. One of the things we notice about wrecks is that they don't deteriorate at the same rate. So meaning the whole wreck isn't disappearing at the same time or at the same rate. So we have a lot of questions about how that happens and why that happens. We know that microbes can cause corrosion. So um, ocean seawater can cause corrosion chemically. That happens often. But microbes can also cause corrosion. And in fact, there are certain microbes like iron oxidizing bacteria that you'll hear a decent amount today from me because I love studying these organisms. Um, they can actually be, cons they're considered primary colonizers on steel structures because again, they need iron to make a living. So if there's a new source of iron, they will attach to it. And in these bottom right corners, you can see some uh, photos of what they look like when we grow them in the lab. So when we grow iron oxidizers in the lab, they will oxidize the iron, the reduced iron we give them, making this rust. You can see this in the bright orange, what we call flocks here. Um, so that's the waste product of the microbe. And what's really cool about these microbes is they make these cells and the iron oxides, they actually grow away from it, but remain attached to it because it's insoluble in the form of things like rust. They don't want to get stuck or entrapped in it, um, but they're continually making this as a waste product in order to gain energy. So you can see these structures, which are really cool to look at under the microscope. Um, but the reality is, is we think they're primary colonizers. And then once they colonize and they're really happy, then sulfate reducing bacteria, which make these black uh, sulfides, um, they're really problematic with uh, biocorrosion as a whole in other steel and in addition to um, actual biocorrosion of wrecks. So we think that the iron oxidizers are primary colonizers, make the environment nice, and the sulfate reducers come in and cause even more problems. So there seems to maybe be a relationship or even a succession between these. But things to think about really are that it's complicated. There's multiple types of microbes that can live on this wreck. Some will be good. In this case, these can be bad. Um, but what can we learn about them and how they do that so we can leverage this information to protect these wrecks long term? Okay, so I work in North Carolina here on the coast. I'm very fortunate that we have great areas to study shipwrecks. And so here we have, we study coastal shipwrecks quite a lot because they really can be these model systems. So here in North Carolina, you know, we have the Graveyard Atlantic. There are thousands of wrecks, um, many of which have very important historical significance and all of which really could be the potential artificial reefs that are out there. So in order to answer the questions we would like to, we need to, to study some of these wrecks. And in fact, we, we like to look at the coastal wrecks because they're both, they're widespread. So we have many to choose from. They can answer different questions. They're important for preserving our cultural history here in North Carolina in particular. Um, they do provide habitat to other organisms and they can be hotspots for biogeochemical cycling. So the other thing about coastal wrecks in particular is that really they allow us, they're more feasible to sample. So as, as I show you some of the pictures of what we did, you'll see that it's much easier to sample some of these shallow water coastal wrecks than it is to sample some of those really deep, deep wrecks like you'll see um, and you often see in, in the videos and, and even the exhibits there. So if we can study some of the shallow water wrecks to answer questions that we can then apply to some of the larger wrecks, that's great. So it's feasible, much easier to access, um, and we can collect a lot of samples. So here's just a photo of the graveyard of the Atlantic. For those that are, are not as familiar with it, the reality is, is the coastline of North Carolina is very difficult for ships. Um, so we have really strong currents, we get many storms. And so because of this, we have a lot of uh, wrecks off the coast. We actually have uh, thousands. And so we can choose some of these as great ways and examples to study the microbes associated with them. So we can start applying them to other wrecks as well. So what were some of our goals when we started out? Well, we really wanted to determine how microbes assemble on the shipwrecks as well as within the site. And then what implications does it have for the fate of these wrecks and the nearby environment? Now, often when we look at shipwrecks, we think about it as just one wreck, but there's an entire wreck environment. It's the wreck, it's different places on the wreck, it's the water nearby, it's the sediment, it's really complex. And so we want to look at it in all of those different areas instead of just saying, well, you know, all of that area is the same. It's one wreck, it's all the same. And what we're realizing is it's not all the same. So what does this mean? 
Okay, so we started off with some really basic questions. You could see in the photo to the right, uh, these are two of my students, or at the time were two of my students, my PhD student, Cody Garrison, and uh, at the time an undergraduate, Kyra Price became master's student. Um, and they worked really hard with me on collecting all of these samples. And you could see that there are multiple ways to sample here. And what we did was we collected samples from the rack in order to answer some of these simple questions. What microbes are there? Who is even living on these wrecks? Uh, we wanted to know if these iron oxidizing bacteria are on the specific wreck we're studying, the Pappy's Lane, and if so, who are they? Now, I know you're probably sitting there going, well, you know, Aaron, these seem like very simple questions. And you know what they are? We are so, it's a young field that we're really starting to just kind of get into now, learning about what the microbes are and how they function. So we got to start kind of at the beginning. So we had the opportunity to uh, sample Pappy's Lane shipwreck. This is a shallow water steel hulled wreck um, located in the Pamlico Sound in Rodanthe, North Carolina. So it's estimated it went down in the 1960s that it basically got caught in a storm. Um, it went down and it's been there ever since. So it was believed to be a World War II gunboat built in 1944. It was decommissioned and turned into kind of a transport vessel where eventually it just um, came to live in the Pamlico Sound. So in the top right corner, uh, the one on the left is Dr. Nathan Richards. He is a, the director of the Maritime Studies Program here at East Carolina University. Uh, and he really led this project along with his Maritime Studies students um, to first identify the wreck. It's been there for so long, yet no one really knew what it was. Many of the pieces that would be identifying um, have either been removed or deteriorated over the years. And so they really wanted to know, what is this wreck? Um, and so our job was to look at, well, who are the microbes on the wreck? And what can we learn about their role in the long-term preservation or deterioration of the wreck? So this is the picture of the wreck itself and its location. You can see that it's currently submerged in this photo, um, but it's not too far off the coast. And this wreck really has become kind of a staple in the community. So people will go around and kayak, they'll explore. Um, there's many fish and other organisms that come in at different times of year. So it's like this really amazing artificial reef. And there are microbes living in what we call biofilms on the surface. So basically biofilms are anything attached to a surface. And we could collect that material to look at who's there. You can see in this photo, they're surveying to better understand um, the material it's made out of, uh, what it looks like in the hopes to help identify it. In our case, it helps us sample many different places around the wreck. So we went in really with two hypotheses. So like, what do we, what do we think is happening? So one thing is we think the microbial community members, so the microbiomes themselves will be different where we see corrosion products versus where we don't see corrosion products. So corrosion products are that rust I was telling you about. And when we look at this wreck, there's areas where it's clearly corroding and there's areas where it's not. And we, we know that they deteriorate at different rates. So is it possible the microbial communities are also different in these two areas? So we wanted to really kind of look at that and see if that's true or not. We also wanted to see if iron oxidizing bacteria were there where we saw visible signs of corrosion uh, and absent where we didn't. So we expect that their waste product is that rust. So if we see the rust, that means they should be there. And if we don't see that rust, we it would expect they're not there um, or, or at least not making the rust. So this was kind of what we went in with some of these hypotheses. So this is where we sampled. The, the goal here was to sample across the entire rack and say, you know, are the microbial communities the same everywhere or not? We hypothesized they were not. Um, much like other microbiomes, we know that they interact with their environments and can be different. So in the top, you're seeing basically a cross section of the ship. So we were able to sample uh, in the submerged section, but above the sediment line. We also were able to, uh, we were able to uh, drill where they were dredging out of the sediment. So partially submerged wreck, we were able to drill pieces out of. And you can see those here in this bottom uh, corner. So we have the stern over here, the bow over here, and each star represents a sample we collected. So in some cases, we were able to collect debris samples, pieces that were already kind of fallen off the wreck um, that had the rust we were seeing. So this picture down here on the left, you see that bright orange rust, which is the waste product of our iron oxidizers or chemical corrosion. We had um, what we call control pieces. So pieces of the wreck that were also mixed with uh, 
oyster shell from previous oysters, so not living, but previous, where we don't see signs of corrosion, but the wreck is there and we know there's microbes living on it. Um, we have our drilled coupon pieces uh, where we're able to actually drill pieces out of the wreck. Uh, and then we had a couple where you see this black precipitate and that black kind of almost like rust, but black material is sulfides. And that is a waste product often of sulfate reducers. Uh, again, it can pre-produce chemically as well, though. So we wanted to compare the communities on all of these different pieces to say, hey, are they the same or are they different? Sorry, sometimes my light goes out. Okay, so how did we sample? Um, there's a lot of ways that we can sample. Like I mentioned, shallow water wrecks are great to work with because it's easy to access. So you can see that at the time uh, that we were sampling here, the water's up to about our waist. And I'm holding one of these drilled uh, coupons that came out of here. You can see Dr. Richards actually doing the drilling right then. Um, as I mentioned, the other pieces we were able to collect um, by hand. Uh, in some cases, we were able to uh, gently scrape with these plastic spatulas to remove the biofilm. Um, so we were able to collect a lot of different types of um, wreck material. And then we also collected nearby sediment and nearby seawater. We expect the communities, the microbiomes that are there, also will be different in the sediment or the seawater. Uh, but the reality is, is most of them that attach to that wreck probably came from one of those places. So, you know, how similar or different are they? Okay, so let's get to it. What microbes do live on these wrecks? I know you're dying to know. Well, in order to do that, what we did was we took all those samples we collected. Um, we gently removed the surface material. We extracted the DNA that was in there, and then we can sequence that DNA um, specific for, in this case, we looked at bacteria, though we are now looking at um, fungi and eukaryotes and other organisms as well, because we know they're there too. So we can take that information we get back from sequencing, and we can identify the community members that are there using a database. Then we can compare these communities. And what you're seeing in, this, in these two figures here, if we start with A, each dot represents one of those samples, the entire microbiome that was there. Now in each dot, we have who's there and basically how many there are. So their relative abundance, how many of each are there. And then we can compare that between different samples. So if dots are closer together, that means those communities are more similar to each other. If dots are further apart, that means those communities are more different. Um, so this gets at some of these questions. And what we're seeing in our results is on the left here, in all of these ship samples, they're more similar to each other than they are to the sediment. So what we're learning is the microbes have kind of found their niche. The ones that live in the sediment are different than the ones that live on the wreck. We saw the same thing with seawater. The ones that live in the seawater were different than each of these. If we look at just the wreck itself, um, what we see is that uh, there are some differences across the wreck. So in this, you can see the, sorry, you can see the green dots and you can see the blue dots, all of which are our um, ship samples. And what we found is those that were visibly corroded were different than those that were not visibly corroded. So where we saw corrosion, we had different microbial community members than where we didn't see corrosion, which supports our hypothesis that they're not all the same everywhere. So to us, that means they're, they're kind of picking their niche and setting up their own community. And that may be affecting the rates of deterioration or which ones did, are deteriorated or corroded and which ones are not. Um, so this was a really exciting finding for us. So that was, you know, we usually think about, well, a shipwreck microbiome, it's one microbiome for the whole ship. But it turns out it doesn't look like it is one microbiome for the whole ship. Instead, they're kind of finding their own happy place or what we call a niche. I like to compare this to it's kind of like the human microbiome. So think about it. You have microbes that live on your skin. You have microbes in your gut. You have microbes everywhere on you. So we have the human microbiome. However, that's not all the same microbes living on your skin that are living in your gut. They're different. So we see a similar thing with the shipwreck. So where they decided to live on the shipwreck does seem to matter. Regardless, we were able to identify almost 5,000 different bacterial species on this wreck. So we know there's a lot of different players. Um, there's a few that seem to be important, like the ones that can cause corrosion. 
but there's many others that do good things. For example, there are species that will make a protective biofilm. And in doing so, they don't allow the seawater to reach the surface of the wreck and it protects them from deterioration. So some of those microbes are living there too. And that's really cool to see. So we're trying to study some of those now as well. Uh, and then many of them just have different roles and different functions. So we found species that are involved in everything from nitrogen cycling to carbon cycling, sulfur and iron cycling. So they really are making this community that's affecting the entire environment. You know, they're all playing a role. Uh, they just differ. So at the end of the day, these organisms really are our foundation for artificial reefs and help encourage biodiversity um, and all the great things that we do want to see. Okay, so that was really cool to see. We really had a great time with that part of the project. And um, I think there's even more, even more species on there than you know we found. That's just where we're at right now. Um, but we did want to, you know, kind of go a little deeper in some specific organisms. So these iron oxidizing bacteria that may be primary colonizers that can kickstart corrosion. You know, are they there and where are they? Because we do want to ultimately preserve these wrecks. So a little background on iron oxidizing bacteria, because I'm sure many of you are like, I've never heard of this before. And that's absolutely fine. Um, basically, the ones that we study, they grow under low oxygen conditions, uh, much like some of the pathogens that can live in your gut, that like low oxygen conditions. These organisms grow at low oxygen and neutral pH, much like the oceans. So, you know, pH seven to eight. And they basically, they're oxidizing iron, so reduced iron to iron three, which makes that rust. So that rust is their waste product after they get energy from that electron. They breathe oxygen. Uh, and then basically what they're doing is they're doing this at low oxygen because chemical oxidation is so quick under these conditions. So the only way they can make a living and stand a chance is to do this under slightly lower oxygen. Um, so that's really about what we would expect if we were at the surface of a wreck so they can get very low oxygen conditions and it's kind of perfect for these iron oxidizers. These uh, steel hold wrecks like the Pappy Lane has iron in it. So it already has the iron it's looking for. So in general, these organisms, like I said, they make these really pretty uh, rust. You can see here, we have our cells and the oxides they make as a waste product. And we can look at them under the microscope. The waste product they make in rust is very different compared to chemical oxidation. So they make these really cool, what we call twisted stalks and these really cool um, sheaths. The sheaths are basically like flattened noodles. So we can look for these and know that these organisms are present. Now we can find them in both marine and freshwater environments. They're actually quite widespread. And we typically associate them with high reduced iron um, just because that's what they need to live. So it's a really hard way to make a living yet they live just about everywhere. So when a wreck occurs, when a ship goes down, there are iron oxidizers in that sediment that may be able to come up and attach to their new habitat. And so that's what we were hoping to see. Uh, are they attached, which would make sense? And if so, how do they vary? So are they just everywhere um, or are they in certain areas? So that's kind of what we went uh, to, to address. So we took those uh, shipwreck pieces that I told you about, those samples we collected um, in the scraped off material. And we set up what we call a most probable number study, an MPN. And so we can grow them in the lab. And that's what you're seeing both Cody and Kyra do here. So you start by inoculating it in this media. This media is specifically made to grow iron oxidizing bacteria. We do a serial dilution in order to get a relative abundance of how many may be there. And then we normalize to the surface area of the shipwreck pieces so we can compare across the board. Now, the reason we grow them is because we didn't know who they were. We don't know if they're freshwater or marine, because this is a bit of an estuary, a little mixed. We don't know um, who the taxa are, so meaning like which species are there. So this is a great way to grow all of them without even knowing who they are yet. So what did we find? So if we look at our um, MPN results, so again, this is the serial dilution I was showing you. After 21 days, we look for growth. Growth looks like this. That's where you see those bright orange flocks I was telling you about. Uh, they're really apparent. And so we know, yep, they're, they're growing so we can count them. And what we saw is we had, we had iron oxidizers across all the samples. So it turns out they're actually everywhere on the wreck. Um, so that was a little surprising to us, but hey, it's a steel hulled wreck. So why wouldn't they be potentially everywhere? But we did say they were in higher abundance um, where we saw visible corrosion, where we saw that rust or their waste product. So we did see higher abundances there. 
Now we wanted to see who they are. That was the other part of the question, right? And we, we use quantitative PCR to amplify for zeta proteobacteria. So this is, I know it's a really fun name to say. I encourage you to use it whenever you can in everyday words, you know. So uh, zeta proteobacteria are, are known to be iron oxidizing bacteria that live in marine environments. And we expected that it was a high likelihood they were our organisms in here. So we used um, PCR to amplify their DNA. And what we found is, again, we find them in all the samples. Um, but they're not in as high relative abundance as the just general MPNs were. Um, so you can see what that means is, see how this box is much wider than say this box up here. So this means that we may have missed some of them. So the zeta proteobacteria are a large proportion of our iron oxidizers, but we don't think it's all of them. So we think there's some more in there uh, that we just haven't identified yet. So we'd love to do that. I can't wait to see who they are. Um, okay, so the next thing was really, okay, what are they, who are they? Like, so we know it's a zeta proteobacteria, but what's the species? And can we get a culture that we could study in the lab, that we can run experiments and really understand their contributions? So this is what it looks like when it grows. Um, and again, if you look at the scanning electron uh, micrographs, they make these twisted stalks as they grow. So it's really unique of these iron oxidizers. Uh, we have since named it Mary Profundus ferrooxidans O1. Um, O1 was the sample it came from. And as we said, they make exactly what we'd expect, these twisted stalks. And we sequence the genomes. That allows us to look at what is the genetic and genomic potential of these organisms. What else are they doing? Um, this is just a really fun close-up. So you can see these are the twisted stalks I was mentioning. And when the cell divides, it actually divides that stalk as well. So this is a really cool image to get to see. I'm gonna do that one more time. Um, we rarely get to see this, so I love getting to show this image. So you can see where the cell divided and it just broke off. Um, so you can always see where the track is of the organism. Okay, so what did we find in the genome? Uh, we know it can oxidize iron, we confirm that, that's great, but it can do more than that. Remember, they're not just going to contribute to corrosion or oxidation, they do other things in the environment. So we found that they fix nitrogen, uh, that's a really important function in aquatic environments, microbes you know, really contribute to that. They fix carbon under both low and high oxygen conditions. Um, and if we think about the nitrogen fixation for just a minute, it seems like a lot of these iron oxidizers may do this more often than we thought. So each one of these stars here is basically showing you an organism that has the genes, so the genomic potential to fix nitrogen. And in all cases, but one, we've confirmed they actually fix nitrogen. So we're, we're still learning about why they're doing that. It could be redox balance and, and environmental conditions. It could be just because they need the nitrogen. There's a lot of cool questions that we can still answer. But I like to showcase that these organisms not only can contribute to things like corrosion, which are bad, and you'd say, hey, we should kill them. We should get rid of them. And I, I do agree, we wanna control their role in that, but they do other things in the environment too for other organisms. So it's cool to think about that. Okay, and then I just briefly want to um, talk about some of the interactions between organisms, right? So we looked at the whole community, which is the big picture. We looked at one specific uh, metabolic group, the iron oxidizers. Um, but what about interactions between some of these groups? So, I mean, if we're, we're thinking and worried about corrosion and biocorrosion, if these iron oxidizing bacteria may be primary colonizers, getting things ready for the sulfate reducers, how do they interact with each other? What can we learn to help apply this information to the wrecks themselves? So what you're seeing here is a photo of the iron oxidizers, what they look like, um, sulfate reducers. Uh, this is one that we often um, see. And then what we did was you can collect, in our case, we, we put out these little what we call steel coupons. They're little pieces of steel. And you let the organisms colonize and start the corrosion process. And then we look at who's there. So we were able to isolate organisms from both. Um, so we have iron oxidizing bacteria and sulfate reducers from the same steel coupon that we could study in the lab and say, how do they interact? So one thing we know uh, when we look at how they each function, one of the things that really separates them is that the iron oxidizers are what we call microaerophiles. They require low oxygen conditions. Our sulfate reducers are anaerobes. They don't want any oxygen whatsoever. So we don't expect they're gonna be, you know, just living together all the time. Um, so how do we grow them together? And what it turns out is we can use what we call gradient tubes. And that's what you're seeing in this picture here. So we have oxygen in the headspace. 
and oxygen will diffuse through this um, kind of auger or agarose material. Think of it as almost like a jello-like material. Then we have sulfide, which will um, kind of go up and interact here, and it'll basically get rid of all of the oxygen in this low section. And then we have reduced iron that's also coming up. So we get these opposing gradients of iron and oxygen. The iron oxidizers will figure out where they want to live, their happy niche for those conditions. Um, and the sulfate reducers will as well. And then typically what we see is the sulfate reducers will grow right until oxygen shows up and then they're done. They don't wanna grow there. The iron oxidizers will grow right until about oxygen disappears. So we expect this separation. And that's exactly what we see when we grow them together. The iron oxidizers want the oxygen, sulfate reducers don't. But we notice there's a clearing space in between the two. And so we, we did this um, study over a few times. And what we saw was that um, what you can see here, are each of these gradient tubes you just saw. So we have the orange where the iron oxidizers were, and then we have the black where the sulfate reducers were. And when the like to confirm what I was just saying, you know, we the iron oxidizers grow until oxygen disappears, sulfate reducers grow until oxygen shows up. But when you grow them together, they leave this zone of clearing. And the sulfate reducer doesn't grow all the way to that oxygen barrier, so where that five is. So they seem to physically separate themselves, and we don't know why. They won't grow too close to each other. So they have to separate themselves when they're near each other. Um, this is something we're really excited about and trying to figure out why this is happening. Uh, we have a few ideas, and I can talk to anybody about that later. Uh, but it's just an interesting dynamic about Oxygen is not the only thing driving their niche and their separation. So there's other things about this relationship we are not aware of yet. And this is important if we're going to try to preserve these wrecks. We need to understand how each of these organisms function. Okay, so hopefully in this whirlwind tour of a shallow water wreck, the Pappy Lane shipwreck, you learned a little bit about the thousands of different microbes that live there. Again, there's so much cool information to learn about these organisms. Um, we do see that they set up shop wherever they want on the wreck or in the wreck environment. So it's what we call niche partitioning. So again, think back to that human microbiome. Everybody doesn't live everywhere. They kind of um, select where they want to be. Um, and then with the Pappy's Lane shipwreck, uh, we do see iron oxidizing bacteria, and they do seem to be more abundant where we see their waste products. Um, so we're really trying to understand what, how we can further this in terms of actually using this information to preserve the wrecks. And then we know who they are, and they seem to have an unclear relationship with the sulfate reducers. We're still trying to uh, figure out a little more about that as well. So where are we going with this? I mean, hopefully you're excited about shipwreck microbes. You probably also have more questions than you have answers. I feel like that every day. So I think, I'll, you know, good thing in my career still got some years in it because I've got lots of questions to answer. Ultimately, we'd really like to integrate more biological sampling and monitoring strategies. Wrecks appear and we don't actually um, sample for, for microbes all the time. Um, we really want early detection methods and bioindicators of which wrecks are going to be more vulnerable to things like corrosion. So who do we have to move up that list to protect first? We, you know, with the Titanic deteriorating so quickly, we didn't realize that would happen. We don't want that to keep happening out there. Lots of lingering questions. I'm so excited to talk to you all about any questions you have, and obviously I have many. This is one example of a wreck. There are so many more wrecks to look at to see, do these trends hold true? What else can we learn? What other uh, environmental conditions drive these assemblages? Um, what are extreme weather events? How do those affect it, especially with coastal wrecks? And how can we apply these to the deep water wrecks too? What are the similarities and differences there? So um, I am excited to chat with you. So I'm gonna stop here. I wanna thank everybody who I've worked with on this project. Um, there's many more people for other projects that I've been working on. So can't wait to talk to you all again about other things we have going on. Um, and ultimately, I'm excited to take questions. I'll stop sharing. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. This okay. I'm yeah. I'm uh, I'm gonna think about microbes now every time I see or hear about shipwrecks because I I would not have. I guess I would have. Somebody would have said, Chris, do you think microbes live and grow in shipwrecks? Yeah, sure. I'm sure there's life, just like I would expect to see corals and sponges yeah. on shipwrecks that are old enough as well. 
but yep. uh, that 5,000 species number really impressed me. Yeah, I it's amazing. Not anticipated and... that kind of diversity. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much diversity. And I think there's even more that we're not aware of yet. Like I said, that's one snapshot with the the samples we had. Um, but yeah, it's quite, I think it really stresses. Yeah, it's not one or two organisms that live there. It's thousands of them. There's a whole community just at the microbial level. Then we didn't even get to, like you said, the sponges and, and the fish and everything else that's there. So it's pretty cool. Really neat, really neat. Uh, so I'll remind everybody, make sure that if you've got questions or thoughts, drop them in the chats and comments. Uh, I'm going to turn to your thoughts and questions here in just a moment. But one thing that occurs to me, Aaron, is um, I don't, it, I've don't. i not been around very many shipwrecks, but they seem like even like a shallow water wreck like the Pappy's Lane, like they could be dangerous. Like they're still made of metal. You're still out there in the ocean water. What's it just like to try to and I saw that it looks like the technicians and researchers are just like walking around on top of it. What is it actually like to be out on a shipwreck? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And safety is an important part of what we do. You're right. It still can um, have its dangers. There's no doubt. You'll notice everybody was wearing coveralls. So we wear these really thick, heavy coveralls to ensure you aren't cut by any metal that could be exposed. Um, you wear it in case. Uh, also, some of these have active oysters on them. So we try to avoid that to make sure that we don't damage them. But some of the um, remaining oyster shells from before can also be very sharp. So we have to be very careful around these wrecks. Um, they're also very. So in terms of, you know, what do we do to prepare for this? You know, we, we try to wear all the right things. You'll notice we're wearing gloves to collect the microbes as well. That was very challenging to do in the water, uh, much easier in just a lab. Uh, but in the water, it's hard. Even when we're doing kind of some of the deeper work where you have to dive, uh, we still have these spatulas where you're, you know, you're collecting in, in some of that biofilm material and you're trying to collect it in a tube while you're underwater. Uh, we've had to do a lot of practicing to get that down, uh, but the divers have been terrific at gaining those skills. Uh, so it's been really fun, but yeah, absolutely. We always have to take extra precautions for safety. Some of the wrecks too, um, because uh, visibility is a factor. So that's one thing I didn't really talk about either is as you go underwater, I mean, some days are going to be more visible than others. And not only you know, you have to collect it underwater, but then you have to see what you're collecting. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I guess the, especially on the Carolina coast where we just have very productive sounds and estuaries already. So the water can be yeah. pretty green and murky most of the time, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, whether we're working here in the coast of North Carolina and where you are, the estuaries obviously have more productivity too. So sometimes the visibility is not as good. Or if it was after a storm recently, that could be problematic. Um, much easier to see things when we do our work in Hawaii, uh, much clearer water, uh, a little bit warmer even sometimes. So they're just such different environments. Oh, so you've, you've been able to, uh, to do some travel to sample microbes. Yeah, we've started to be able to do some travel again. So, you know, field work for a while was on hold, like everybody's. Um, so we're really excited to be back at it and getting to do more field work again and collect some more samples. Interesting stuff. Fascinating. Uh, we'll have to have you back to hear about Hawaii microbes. Okay, uh, some questions have come in for you. The first one that I have here, how did you manage to identify 4,800 species? Was it microscopy or another method like the DNA sequencing? Yeah, so for those samples, that was DNA sequencing. Um, we are really fortunate with our sequencing technologies now to be able to collect thousands of sequences per sample. So we can get, you know, 10,000 different sequences to identify each one and what organism they came from. So that's how we identified the near 5,000. And Glenn wants to know, does the type of iron like cast iron, carbon steel, stainless steel have an effect on the species of microbes? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I will say that the type of iron absolutely affects things like corrosion. And we know that it can affect the microbes that attach. It is one of the things that we're trying to look more at. Absolutely. Is not even just, is it steel? Is it carbon steel? What type of steel? We've done some other studies looking at different steels and we see the communities can be different. So we 
do think that the type of uh, metal itself matters um, as well as, you know, where they are on the wreck. Okay. And early in the talk too, in a similar vein, you pointed out that ships are made of all kinds of different things. Uh, different parts of the same ship can be made of different materials. Uh, are there specific wrecks that are like on your list? Like you've got a, a bulletin board of lit of shipwrecks and you're like, all right, we're going to do this one and then this one and then this one in order to try to get at some of that diversity. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we do have our, we have different wrecks we want to study to answer different parts of these questions. Um, and that absolutely is one of them. You know, if we know that some wrecks are made of different materials, one of the big things uh, is knowing, is having those schematics and knowing what the material was for the wreck. So with Pappy's Lane, we weren't able to identify the specific wreck. So we don't have the you know, specific metal composition for each of those areas we sampled, but we have some other wrecks we're looking at now where we do have that kind of information. And so we can actually compare that to say, this is the metal um, that was constructed in this uh, ship. And then these are the communities associated with that area. So it is absolutely something we want to look at more. And we do think it is important. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got another one here for you. Do you see different species of invertebrates colonizing the wreck depending on types of biofilm and bacteria? Yeah, that's a terrific question too. Um, we do anecdotally, um, so visually we do see the differences just like with the microbes um, that we've been able to measure. We see that there are different um, larger organisms, whether it's sponges or um, oysters or other things that they vary where they're happiest as well. We haven't been able to do a correlation yet with the microbial communities and that, uh, though I'd love to. And we have started, um, you know, working with some people who study some of the larger organisms so that we can hopefully start addressing these things as a whole community instead of individually. And then the next question here, uh, how did you get into this field? Can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Yeah, terrific question. Um, I would say much like everyone, you're like, I don't know exactly how I got here. But what I can tell you is I did my first postdoc uh, working with iron oxidizing bacteria in marine systems. So these organisms have been near and dear to my heart for a long time, looking at them everywhere from hydrothermal vents uh, to coastal systems um, to bio, you know, um, contaminant mobility and things. So these organisms are something that I've been studying for a while. And then my thought was, well, we see them on steel structures. Why wouldn't we see them on shipwrecks? And I came to East Carolina University and we have a terrific maritime studies program. So uh, Dr. Richards and I got to talking and we're like, we'd really like to look at the bio corrosion and the role of microbes on these wrecks. So that's kind of how I got into it. And I just couldn't be happier. That's it. So, uh, so you came at it for, it wasn't the shipwrecks first. It was microbiology. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So I'm a, a microbiologist by training, uh, turning maritime historian, uh, learning more about that side of it. Uh, and it's been fun because I, we've been teaching them as well. So all the maritime archaeologists are becoming microbiologists and it's been really fun to work on. You know, it makes me think about, um, some of the recovery efforts that are happening off our coast, like um, uh, the Queen Anne's Revenge, for example, yeah. like across the street from us here in Raleigh, we have the Museum of History, which is always talking about pirates. Then the maritime museums out on the coast are always doing uh, pirate festivals and yeah. days. And the one in Beaufort, I think, is even in charge of Queen Anne's Revenge material, which is now hundreds of years old. And as they think about rem remediating and conserving some of those old relics, how does research like yours maybe play into what they do? Yeah, terrific, yeah, terrific question. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to work towards. So right now, like I said, we're in such a introductory general question area that we've been working on developing methods to sample, um, knowing what we can just learn in general about those communities. But yeah, when it comes to preservation and, you know, with them pulling, you know, the history basically out to preserve it, knowing more about which microbes are on there will help them kind of modify or tweak their methods for doing this. So they know corro they address corrosion as a whole, um, mm -hmm. But sometimes we don't account for the microbial aspect. So if our preserving is for chemical corrosion and the microbes are still there, you know, we may need to uh, modify as needed. So, 
yeah, it's a so work in progress. Thinking. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. Uh, you know, I I've heard of rust before, sure, but I had not heard of iron oxidizing bacteria before. That it could be an organic process as well as a chemical one. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, there's, I didn't even touch on the iron reducers, like that one associated with the Titanic that is then eating the rest. You know, they're a whole nother aspect too that we need to really consider. And so again, same thing, you know, we preserve all those pieces. Uh, even here um, at ECU, we have some of them that they're working on preserving from the Queen Anne's Revenge. And so knowing what the microbes are and the biological processes may help as well to, um, to really make sure that we reach the goals we want. Excellent stuff. Okay, next question from the chat for you. Is there a seasonal variation in bacteria due to water temperature? Absolutely. So we know that microbes in general change with season. There are always seasonal influences that are associated with temperature. Um, some of them can also be due to salinity changes. So in estuaries, tides and everything can make these changes. We're learning what they are when they're directly associated with the wreck. So living in those biofilms on the wreck, we don't know yet how temperature is necessarily affecting them all. Um, so that's something that we're actually looking at with another wreck right now where we're sampling um, over the course of a couple of years multiple times. And so we'll revisit it and we can address some of the how the communities are changing and um, on what time scale. So those are things we'd really like to look at. And, and when you're thinking about shipwreck microbes and these microbiomes, think of them as, you know, living, breathing entities. So the wreck is there, but the microbes and the other organisms associated are always changing and shifting. So we're trying to understand what controls that temperature being one of those aspects, and then also on what time scale. Okay, great. Interesting. Good question. Uh, let's see here. It seems you would need to cooperate with various local, state, and federal agencies and organizations to do research on these vessels. Can you tell us about how that works? Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. It takes a team effort to sample any of these wrecks um, to do this kind of work. I've been very fortunate to have an amazing team to work with. Um, you know, Nathan Richards and the Maritime Study Program has been terrific, um, but we do, we have to work with agencies that provide permits. Um, we've done work with NOAA, um, some of the historical trusts. Uh, we've, it's basically, you need to apply for permits. You need to have your justification. We do whatever we can to limit any damage or further deterioration of these wrecks. The one that um, we were able to collect pieces, we were able to get permitting um, as it is, uh, it was in the lane of where they're putting in um, a bridge extension. And so it was a rare opportunity to actually physically collect some pieces, but many times we just gently remove some of the biofilm surface material so that we don't have any sort of issues there. But you do, you have to work with federal agencies for permits. You have to make sure that you're reporting all of your data. I think that's an important part of it. Um, yeah, but it takes a team effort. Very interesting. Yeah, they're not, you can't just like go out and pick up a piece of a shipwreck. Exactly. I and I don't encourage it either because right. that piece was there, you know, probably helping many organisms that you don't realize. Um, but it does happen. I mean, that is the reality that, you know, over the times, mm -hmm. you, uh, as wrecks are getting exposed to with all of these storms, you know, people will naturally want to explore them and check them out. Good point. Good point. Uh, let's see. Clarifying question came in from Deb Bailey. So bacteria in a biofilm are much less likely to be affected by environmental conditions, correct? Yeah, that's a great clarifying question. Um, so in general, when microbes are associated with a biofilm, there's like this protective, what we call extra polymeric substance layer around it. Because of that, you often um, don't get as much a diffusion. So things that would affect you living by yourself versus like if you're in a whole group of people, um, it's kind of a similar concept. So whether it's something like dental plaques, like dental biofilms, um, or whether it's, uh, you know, cystic fibrosis, pseudomonas biofilms in your lung that are harder to get rid of because they have that protective layer. Biofilms on surfaces like shipwrecks also have a little more of a protective layer for themselves. So we don't know the answers yet in terms of how much that will affect these wreck communities or not, but we do know that in general, biofilms are more protected from outside forces. Excellent. And can you tell us the difference between iron oxidizers and iron reducers? Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at iron cycling, we have basically two forms of iron. We have iron two, which is reduced. It's often a dissolved form of iron. And then we have iron three, which is insoluble. And it's that kind of rust we were talking about. 
So iron oxidizers take iron two, the dissolved form, and make it into rust, the uh, you know non-dissolved form. And they do that to gain energy. So they get the electron and they gain energy that way. Um, the iron reducers take that rust and they basically put it back into dissolved iron two. Uh, they use it as an electron acceptor to gain energy. So they're doing that instead of using oxygen often. So it's just the cycling of iron into an insoluble form and a soluble form. So think about it as, an iron oxidizer takes iron two, makes it into rust, which is now insoluble. Another organism is going to eat that rust, basically. They're going to convert it back to a dissolved form, and then it can basically float away in the ocean. And that's kind of how that process um, is linked. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> Just a big circle. Yeah. Of all of these nutrients and uh, elements moving around. That's fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And all being done by life. Mm hmm. Or sometimes done by life, I guess. Exactly. Yep. So sometimes it, it can happen chemically as well. Um, but microbes are happy to do it for us. <laughs> Is there, okay. Uh, looks like we're almost out of time. Is there a shipwreck that you've heard about or seen and you just go, yeah, I really want a piece of that boat. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, there's so many for different reasons. Um, you know, there's some that they have found deep in the Antarctic that I would love to see someday or at least be able to uh, collect samples from. In terms of shallow water wrecks, I just there's been so many cool wrecks here in North Carolina that it's really hard to pick one. But I just feel very fortunate that I get to do this um, in North Carolina. It's just such a great, a great place to study these things. That's an excellent place to leave it. Uh, Dr. Field, thank you very much for being on the Lunchtime Discovery Series today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Excellent stuff. Really appreciated it. Great talk. Uh, and hey, thanks to all of you viewers for tuning in today as well. Of course, we'll be back here with another edition next Wednesday at noon. Go ahead, subscribe. Uh, and you can sign up for the email list serve to get notified about the upcoming presentations. You can see a link to that over in the chat window from the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. You just give that a click and that'll take you right where you need to be. You can also check out the event calendar at naturalsciences.org and look for Lunchtime Discovery Series programs. And uh, we'd be happy to have you here every single week tuning in, bringing all of these great questions and great insight. Until next time, everybody, uh, you know, get out there. Hope you learned something new this week. I know you learned something new today because I did. Uh, and take care of yourselves. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.